Hello, we are in our next uh, lessons of You Are Never Alone by Max Licato. And um, our hymn for today is one of my favorites from my youth. And I have to admit, my youth was a long time ago, but I still have vivid memories of singing this hymn within the fellowship of my church family. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. And I don't know if this hymn is a familiar one from your youthful days, but we used to um, do some fun things with the refrain. We would slow it down. Some people would sing the part as, as we just sang it. Uh, some would sing it slower. Jesus, Jesus. And some would sing it faster. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Um, when, what, however we sang it, um, I enjoyed it when I was young, and I hope that it lifted your spirit some today, too. Our joys and concerns, uh, I don't have any new ones that have been brought up, um, except uh, for Larry's family, and I do not have details on that, but you can add it to your list and rest assured that God will be aware of what you're alluding to. Let's have our time of prayer. Father, we breathe out self and take in a deep breath of you. That is the desire of our heart, Father, to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And we lean into you today with concerns that we share for those that we love or for friends that we know of that are struggling with various challenges in their life, and even for ourselves, Father. We sometimes are quick to ask for prayers for others, but not so anxious to put our own needs out there for everyone. So, for those unspoken needs, Father, we lay them before you knowing that we are loved by you, that you are good, and that you have the power to take care of us. And we thank you. We thank you for all of the ways that you have guided us and protected us and provided for us and loved us and poured your mercy out upon us. Father, we know today that as we look at the news from around the world, we see that humanity has a great need. There are humans everywhere that are suffering from poverty and oppression, that are suffering from injustices, that are suffering from disease and inequities. And there are those who are suffering in the midst of conflict. It's almost too much to imagine, Father. But we know that nothing is too much for you. 
and that you are indeed the source that is needed to quell these issues for humanity and that we as your children serve as your agents in this world and that it is up to us to be a light in the darkness, up to us to be a helping hand, us to, up to us to serve others in ways that bring your kingdom to fruition. And we pray, Father, heartily that your kingdom come and that your will be done among all mankind. And we lift this up and present ourselves to you as living sacrifices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening is from Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 3 and 5 through 6. Let's read it together. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitalities to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Max Licata in his book, You Are Not, You Are Never Alone, attempts to accomplish the purpose of convincing us that when we are in a spot where we think no one cares and that no one is there to help us and that we are alone and that no one hears us or uh, is there for us, that we are never alone because that's a very human experience, but also we are never alone because God is with us. And the Apostle John, in his gospel, wrote stories and events uh, for us to think about in that regard. And he wrote many, which we will be looking at. And at the end of his gospel, he wrote this in John 20, 31. For these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So as he weaves these events and teachings together, John is laying a foundation for this promise. You are never, ever alone. Even Jesus assured us of this as it's recorded right before his ascension in Matthew uh, 28. He sa Jesus said, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus wanted to show us in his deeds and in his teachings that there is a miracle working God who loves and cares and comes to our aid. You and I long to know that there is someone with us in the midst of our messes. And so let's look at the book of John and the miracles of Christ to help satisfy that longing. The first chapter we will look at is we can solve this. We can solve this. And there are, <clears throat> in our life experiences, there are times that we feel overwhelmed. Usually it's when a task we face seems beyond our capabilities. You know the feeling. Panic starts surfacing when the information is too much to learn, 
or the grief is too deep to manage, or the really essential tasks of the day can't be accomplished in the time available, or when you are really needed in two or three places at the same time. As I've served on the care team here at the church for the past 10 years, I can tell you that there are many members of our church family that are faced with overwhelming issues that are combined. There are demanding economic issues combined with serious health issues or health issues of loved ones that, that need care. Life can indeed be overwhelming. And in the sixth chapter of John, Jesus' disciples are going to tell him about a problem before them that they believe is too big. John 6, 1 through 14. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. That's an, another name. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. John didn't just happen to mention the Passover festival. It gives us some insight into the state of mind of the people that we're going to be talking about. Passover was a springtime celebration. And for the Jews, it was a season of possibilities. Because it was during this time that they, uh, their rituals and their remembrances were uh, collectively drawn together about <clears throat> Moses delivering them from slavery in Egypt. Those memories were revived every year at Passover. And as that happened, they would anticipate a new leader that would set them free from oppression. <clears throat> and into this state of mind of anticipation for deliverance comes Jesus. And there's questions among the people. Would a Nazarene miracle worker deliver them? They hope so. They had heard about his healings and his teachings and had followed him. Verse 5 says, And when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. I think... Um, Sometimes when we hear that, he asked this only to test him. He already knew what he wanted to do. It sort of cast Jesus in the position of um, being a little tricky, doesn't it? Or manipulative. But uh, I'll share with you how I have dealt with this phrasing. It appears to me that when you read through the Gospels that there are is a high frequency of time when Jesus answers questions or causes his followers to think by asking them a question. Jesus knew that he had a limited amount of time to impart a huge amount of understanding to his people so that the work could be carried on and so, as for any teacher, it's necessary to um, provide situations. When I was teaching, it was always important for me to assess where my students were in their learning. It was important for more than one reason. One, it was important so that I could fine-tune my teaching to 
uh, move them more efficiently toward the goal. Um, but it was also, as, they, as students get older, the test or the questions are actually intended to prompt their development, for them to see how much they know, for them to see what they need to know or what they haven't quite mastered yet. And so I believe that it is out of this sense of trying to determine where his disciples were in their understandings and trying to get them to see where they were in their understandings. So he asked them this question, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? And Philip answered him. Philip seems to be a very realistic follower. He said, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread to give even a tiny bite to all these people. In other words, we don't have what it would take, Jesus. We don't have enough money. Um, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small, small barley loaves and two small fish. It's a start, you know. Um, but then he, he must have noticed the, the enormous number of people. And he said, but how far will they go among all these people? I highlighted that phrase in your notes that were emailed to you. All these people, it was mentioned three times. Jesus notices all these people and he hopes to feed them. Philip, being realistic, notices all these people and says, we don't, there are too many mouths, we don't have enough money. And Andrew offered an idea about a, a boy's lunch but when he noticed all these people, he said, well, it's not enough for all these people. The disciples were overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenge. What would our version of all these people be? What would our version of an overwhelming obstacle be for us? It might be all these long and lonely, isolated COVID days. For us, it might be all these bills or all these doctor's appointments or all the weeds overgrowing the garden, all the clutter in the closets. And we are left feeling powerless. The disciples counted the huge number of hungry people and the limited amount of money, and they counted the small number of loaves and fishes, but they did not count Christ. And he was standing right there. No one, not one of them said, what about you, Jesus? You can do it. You made gallons of excellent wine out of water. None of them thought of Jesus as a resource. So Jesus just did something. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Uh, it does not give account for the women and children that were with those men. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Remember when Philip said, we don't have enough money. Even if we had a year's wages, we wouldn't have enough money to buy enough for everyone to have a tiny bite. But we're not talking about 
a tiny bite. They had as much as they wanted. It was an all-you-can-eat buffet. And he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Do you think it was accidental that Jesus had twelve disciples? None of, him, none of them had thought of him as a resource, and he had a basket of leftovers for each one. The impossible challenge of feeding all these people became the amazing miracle of all these people having enough. That is a headline straight from the Gospels. What we cannot do, Christ does. The problems we face are opportunities for Christ to prove his point, opportunities for God to show us what he can do. He can help you to do the impossible. I'd like to share a story with you at this point about a lady named Biddy Chambers, and I doubt very seriously that you are familiar with that name. Biddy met her husband in 1908, and they married in 1910. They lived in London, and they had a mutual dream of starting a Bible college. And they purchased a, a large home and made rooms available for students and missionaries to start their college. Now, her husband was the biblical scholar and the teacher but Biddy contributed to their partnership. She was a stenographer, and so she took careful notes of her husband's lectures and turned them into correspondence courses. Now, as you notice the date, 1908 and 1910, it wasn't long before the outbreak of World War I, and her husband felt a calling to minister to the soldiers during the war, and so he and Biddy and their two-year-old child moved to the Middle East, and he served as a chaplain. He lectured, and she took down his messages. It was a great partnership. But unfortunately, at the age of 43, her husband suffered from the ill effects of an appendectomy and passed away. And she, after bury him, him there, burying him there, she chose to return to London with her child. And she could have just given up then and there because no longer did she have her husband who was the, the biblical scholar and lecturer and teacher. All she had were her stenography skills, but she offered this, her loaves and fishes, to God. And she began the project of turning his lecture notes into uh, writings and pamphlets that she distributed to uh, friends and acquaintances, and they became so popular, eventually they were compiled into a book, a very famous book, called My Utmost for His Highest, which is a devotional book written by Oswald Chambers but it could never have been accomplished. It was accomplished after his death because of his wife's gift. It is a book with 366 daily devotionals 
that has been in print ever since it was published in 1927. It has never gone out of print. It has sold over 13 million copies and it has been translated into 39 languages. Billy Graham was someone who fell under the influence of the theology and the witness in my utmost for his highest. Uh, Bill Wilson and Bob Smith, who were the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, initially used My Utmost for His Highest uh, as their, the book that they used to open each of their meetings for the folks that were seeking to overcome their addictions to alcohol. This book of Oswald Chambers exceeded even his wildest imagination, but it was the faith full offering of his wife that made the difference. She gave what she had to Jesus and he accomplished much with it. So, you and I simply need to give him what we have and watch him work. It closes with, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. John tries to remind us continually that the miracles were not performed just to amaze or entertain. The miracles were performed to point people toward God. So the next time you feel overwhelmed, Remind yourself of the one who is standing with you. You are not alone. What bewilders you does not bewilder him. All you have is a prayer. Give it. All you have is a meager talent. Use it. All you have is strength for one step. Take it. It's not for you and me to tell Jesus our gift is too small. God can take a small thing and do a big thing. He used the fussing of baby Moses to attract the Pharaoh's daughter. He used a boy named David and a sling and a stone to overthrow the mighty Goliath. So remember, he's not stumped by your problem. It has never happened, and it will never happen, that you will let God know of your need and that he will turn to the heavenly host around him and say, Oh my goodness, someone's finally done it. This is too much even for me. It'll never happen. Give him what you have. Offer thanks. And watch him go to work. The next chapter is, I am in the storm with you. Those of us that live in the Houston area are very well aware of storms. We have hurricane strength storms that we've experienced and there's thunder and lightning and wind and rain all full of power beyond our imagination. Those are the storms that are weather events. But the word storms is also used to indicate spiritual challenges. It might be health problems or family rifts or economic distress or consequences of our sin. But all of us have faced our share of storms. And so did the disciples. John 6, 16 through 18. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat 
and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, and I know that's not the end of the sentence, but I want to stop there for just a minute. If you've been rowing with a current for three or four miles, um, it's not so hard. With a good current, a boat can cover a mile every 30 minutes, but against the wind and the waves, it becomes back-breaking work to push and pull those oars, and the progress is minimal. They were still too far from the shore. It was too long of time in the struggle, and their boat was too small against the waves. You can probably remember a time like that in your life. Struggles with a rebellious child stretch on and on. A health concern may evade healing and persist for decades. The threat and restrictions of the global pandemic may loom for months. When you are in the midst of life's storms, it may seem never ending. But then, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, walking on the water, and they were frightened. First of all, people do not walk on water ordinarily. Uh, scholars also tell us that it was a common belief in that period of time that uh, those that had died at sea were in a nether world below the sea and sometimes were known to escape through the sea back to the surface. And so it's possible that the disciples thought that Jesus was a ghost that had escaped from the deep. But that isn't what's important for us to note here. What's important for us to note is that when there is a storm, first of all, we don't even want to be in the storm. And second of all, what we want is for the storm to be over. But those are not what happened here. Before Jesus calms the storm, he comes to us in the midst of the storm. And he says to us, as he said to these, but he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Now the literal translation of what Jesus said is, I am, don't be afraid. I am is God's name. We first heard of it uh, when Moses was at the burning bush and God identified himself as I am. Exodus 3, 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That title, I am. While mysterious, it is also a title of steadfastness and power. When we are wondering if God is coming, he answers with his name, I am. When we wonder if he is able, he declares, I am. And when we see nothing but darkness, feel nothing but doubt, and wonder if God is near, the answer is, I am. 
in the midst of a storm. Yes, you want it to pass, but you want to know, you need to know, and you must know that the great I am is with you. Isaiah 43, 1 through 3 and verse 5. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the only one of Israel, your Savior. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Jesus wants us to know his name and to hear him say, I am coming. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The moment they took him into the boat was the moment they reached their destination safely. Believe that you are never alone that our miracle-working God sees you, cares about you, and will come to your aid. He is still the great I Am. In your handout, there are some scripture readings for next week's lessons that will help prepare your heart and mind for the lesson. And let's close. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God uphold you. With his sheep, securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we meet, till we meet. God be with you till we meet again. Amen.